Okay, I'm Blake Wood. I'm from Los Alamos, New Mexico. And tell me about your connection with Hard Rock. Well, let's see. I've uh, been running Hard Rock since 1994. Hard Rock was my first 100 miler. And I've got 20 finishes now in 20 attempts. Hopefully this year will be 21st. Um, I've been on the uh, board of directors for Hard Rock or the, or the proto board for um, over 20 years. Um, currently, I'm a, a emeritus member of the board of directors. And so have, have both been running and, and been involved with, with actually organizing and putting on Hard Rock for um, over 20 years. Tell me what happens tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. Yeah, so at 6 a.m., the 145 people we have starting this year are going to assemble uh, on the other side of the gym here and, and get ready to go out and run 100 miles in the mountains. And it's, uh, it's hard to describe what that feels like standing there. You know, you got all your friends around and, and hopefully some family out to come see you off. But, you know, it, there's, there's a, a, lot to, a lot to look forward to and, and quite frankly, a lot to be, uh, um, to anticipate and, and, and be unsettled by, you know, coming up because, you know, there's going to be weather, you know, there's steep climbs, um, there's river crossings, and, and it's just going to be a long time out on your feet. And hopefully everybody will make it around in a big counterclockwise circle and end up back here in under 48 hours to kiss the rock and, and get their finish. Tell me about kissing the rock. <laughs> it's, uh, that's the tradition here at Hard Rock is you have to kiss the rock to, uh, to actually signify your finish. That's when the, that's when the clock stops. Um, we have, a, have a, uh, a very nice rock big old mining rock that the you know they used to use for for mining competitions for drilling holes in rock uh, for the hard rock miners um, that this town is is uh, originally constructed for and um, yeah it's nothing quite like the feeling of, of making it all the way around and getting back to the same place you started and and uh, getting to kiss that rock and then get congratulations from your friends and your family and and even better than standing around and watching everybody else come in uh, that's that's uh, finishing after you and, and cheering them on as well yeah. Tell me about the Hard Rock family coming back here and seeing people you know and running 20 or 20 plus runs. Yeah. Well, that's really what makes Hard Rock special. You know, my, my daughters, I have three daughters and, and they grew up coming here. Um, they're all in their 30s now, but, you know, my first year here, uh, my youngest daughter was, uh, I guess, four years old. And, and she has actually paced me in, over the entire course in pieces, as has uh, a second daughter of mine. Uh, neither of them will be here this year, but my oldest daughter will be here with our grandkids, who are now actually older than my daughters were when I first started running here at Hard Rock. And, you know, that's what, what really makes Hard Rock Hard Rock are, are the, the family and the friends, not just the runners, the other runners, but, but, you know, their families that you see come back every year. You see their kids grow up. Um, you know, every year you make new friends, you meet new people. And um, having them come back year after year really makes this something that, that, of course, I look forward to as a runner. And, and my girls and my family, and my wife, all look forward to, uh, you know, to coming back every year because they see people they know. Um, my dad will be here later today. Um, he's come almost every year that I've run. And, and in fact, in, in early years, he paced me on the course uh, pretty much every year for the first few years. And, you know, now he's uh, 80 six years old and so he's not not running along with me anymore but but he'll be here to watch because uh the same thing he he has friends of his that, that are here that he's seen here for years and years so so it's fun and and i coach uh at our local high school coach cross country and track as, as an assistant coach and there have been uh, many of the kids that i've coached that have that have been coming here to hard rock uh, sometimes pacing me sometimes pacing other people uh, there will be several of them here today um, and, and for this year's uh, who are, are just you know, coming to help out at aid stations or, or pace another runner. And again, you know, you, I, I can go back and look at my photos from early years when they were, you know, waist high and now they're, you know, strapping young men and, you know, and, and fast young women that are out here running significant portions of the course with, with friends and parents. And um, that's pretty cool to see. Yeah. Do you have a favorite section of the course? 
boy, that's hard to say. I mean, all of it is pretty spectacular. Um, I, I actually kind of like this direction. You know, we change, we, we change the direction every year, uh, and this is a counterclockwise direction. Um, I think, for me at least, this is always a slower direction, but I think I kind of like this direction um, because you see more of the real beautiful parts of the course in the daylight, at least for me, at the, at the pace that I run at. Um, we get to be over handies uh, in the afternoon of the first day, and then it'll be light again uh, going over Grant Swamp, which also is, is probably one of my favorite parts of the course. In this direction, uh, going over Grant Swamp is, is a very difficult climb with a final scramble of several hundred feet just up this insanely steep scree slope. Uh, but, it, but it's late in the race, uh, just short of 90 miles, and, and you get to the top and you have a beautiful view of, of one of the most scenic parts of the course looking down at Island Lake, which is this big turquoise colored lake with a great big island right in the middle of it. Um, that's pretty special. Uh, uh, Virginia's Pass with Kroger's Canteen at the top, uh, which is one of our aid stations. This is a 13,000 foot pass in this little notch in, in this cliff um, that you climb up three of these long snow pitches to get to the top and it's very exposed and uh, Rock Horton and his crew carry up an entire aid station in many, many trips up there. And you go up there and, you know, they have hot food and they have shelter and, you know, they usually have tequila. Which, and um, it's, a, it's kind of an amazing place to, to find somebody, you know, for me usually in the wee hours of the morning to get up there. And here's this whole crowd of people that are all there to help us out and cheering people on and, and, and taking care of us and making sure we're fed and watered. It's a, it's a pretty special place. For me, I think there's a couple places that are real important. Uh, being able to run late in the course, late in the, in, in the run, uh, is kind of critical. And sometimes I can do it and sometimes I can't. Um, the section from uh, the, the KT, the Com Traverse Aid Station, uh, a lot of that to the finish is actually fairly runnable. And um, if I can, you know, start rolling along on that section, I can actually shave off a pretty fair amount of time there. Uh, similarly, um, being able earlier, much earlier in the race, just before or just after the halfway point, being able to run down the long 5,000 plus foot descent from Engineer Pass down to Uray is, is a fairly critical section. Again, a section that if you can run that, um, you can make up a lot of time and you know, if you can't, as has happened to me sometimes, uh, you burn a lot of time there as well. I also hope going up the Camp Bird Road out of Uray up to the Governor Basin Aid Station, that's a, a nine mile stretch up a dirt road. And it's, it's runnable if you're fresh, probably not at, that's like 55 to 65 miles on the course. But if I can move along that as fast as I can, that's another place that I can avoid burning time. It's a hard climb. It is a hard, hard climb. Because it's just, you know, I mean, if, if you're just going out for a workout, I, it's a pretty easy run uphill. And I'm sure Killian and Jason Schlarb and the guys that are in the front, they probably run the whole thing. But um, for me, at that stage in the race, in what is usually just after midnight for me, um, it's, it's tough. You know, and there's sections of it you can run, um, but the main thing is just is just to keep rolling on it and keep walking fast, and you can make a fair amount of time up, you know, if, if you just keep moving, as opposed to kind of staggering along and, and taking it slow. Yeah, uh, the Animus River. Tell me about what Hard Rock does for your soul or does to your <laughs> soul. What Animus means? Well. We see the Animus River, uh, um, particularly up by uh, um, the uh, Grouse Gulch Aid Station. We're going along it, and, and of course we we see it from the in this direction in the first part of the course, and and, and then return to it um, at about 42 miles. And um, it's a it's a beautiful place. Um, you know, the river is is right now is running right outside the house that we've rented for this weekend that we're staying in. And, you know, we've been sitting there in the chairs, looking up at Kendall Mountain and listening, opening the window so we can listen to the river go by. And uh, 
it's a nice thing. Tell me about the weather. Ah, you know, you never know what's going to happen with the weather. And, and we've had in the last few days uh, a fair bit of rain out here on the course. It looks like it's getting a little bit better in the last, over the last couple of days, but we'll definitely get rained on. I, I think in the 20 times I've run this, I can only think of one year where I didn't get rained on at least once. Um, but sometimes it's more than others, and, and, it, and it depends on where you are on the course. Uh, there was um, the last time I went in this direction, which would have been in 2013, was a year where, where there were intense thunderstorms very localized at various places in the course, and a lot of people just got completely hammered multiple times. You know, we're, I mean, just drenching downpours and hail that went on for a long time and kind of went with them. And on the other hand, that year for me, I hardly got any rain. I just happened to be, you know, like an hour behind or ahead of where the storm was really coming down. And so I, I actually had pretty good weather. And when the weather really did descend on where I was, I just happened to be in an aid station when it really started coming down. And so I just, you know, stood under an awning for 10 or 15 minutes waiting for it to pass. And so um, it was interesting afterwards because so many people were telling stories of, of torrential rains and, and quite frankly, very dangerous thunderstorms. I think that was probably the year that we had somebody actually get hit by lightning and up on Handy's Peak. and. Um, you know, I didn't see any of that, and I was running the same course, you know, in the same, you know, 40 hours as they were. I just happened to be in a little different place than they were. So, you know, you know, you got to be prepared for it, because uh, that'll certainly end your race if you're not, and you get in those kind of conditions, because it can get cold very, very fast, and it's, and it's ended a lot of people's races before. But, um, you know, if you're prepared, um, you ought to be okay. Do you have, last question, do you have any wild and tough stories from your 20 years? Gosh, you know, there's, it's kind of funny because the years are sort of mushed together after a while, but, but there have been some, some, for me, fairly key things that I remember out there. Um, there was one year which was, which was the, the closest year I ever came to actually dropping out of the run, which was my second year running here in 1996. And uh, I came into it a little bit under train because I had been injured and went out way too fast. It was in the same direction we're doing it this year. And uh, had basically decided I was going to drop at your aid. And luckily ran into a friend of mine, uh, Gordon Hardman, who was one of the, one of the originators of this, um, as I was coming into your aid. And I told him I was going to drop. And he said, no, he said, just, just you know, lay down and take a nap and don't decide don't drop until you've laid down and slept for a little while. And so I did that and slept for 45 minutes and got up and decided, well, okay, I can keep going at least one more aid station. And I went to the next aid station and again, just felt so lousy that I laid down and took another 40 minute nap. And when I woke up from that, it was, it was just before dawn and I could see that it was just starting to get light and decided that I you know, thought I'd probably feel better once it got light and decided to keep going. And the rest of the run was, was a blast. Um, you know, it was beautiful. I just took it slow, you know, came in, still got a finish, you know, of somewhere around 40 hours, 41 hours. And, you know, my dad paced me for the last probably 16, 20 hours of it. And, and we, we had a terrific time. So that was very educational um, for, you know, not, not giving up. Um, there was another time that was uh, interesting where, uh, that I also learned a good lesson for. Um, the year that I, that I won Hard Rock in 1999, um, I, this was, uh, I went into, uh, we were going in the other direction, I went over Handy's and got into the Sherman Aid Station, and I had expected to get there just a short time before dawn, but I was running three hours ahead of what I had thought I was going to run. And so, you know, this was back in the days before LED flashlights. And so I had, you know, I was carrying this great big, you know, double cell Sears Roughneck, you know, incandescent flashlight, which was nearly dead. And in my drop bag, all I had was a little, you know, small two AA cell flashlight um, that 
wouldn't last for as long as I had until dawn. I thought I was only going to need it for maybe an hour at the most, and I needed it for three hours, and it wasn't going to last that long. So I'm thinking, you know, what am I going to do? I don't have, you know, I, and I can't swap batteries because they're two different, you know, two different flashlights. And luckily, another runner came into the aid station at about the same time, and, and we left at about the same time. And, uh, and I, he turned out, you know, I, I didn't know him at the time, but, but since then he's become a very good friend, uh, Scott Gordon. And so I asked him, I said, you know, I don't have a flashlight that's going to last. Do you mind if I just kind of sponge off your flashlight? And he said, sure. And so uh, for the next few hours, him and a pacer and me um, hiked up the trail, and I'd just occasionally flick on my flashlight when I needed it, but most of the time just walk behind them and, and use their flashlight to see where, where we were going. Um, and then, uh, then when the sun came up, you know, we took off. And, and that was also very educational about um, planning and making sure not just that you know what, what you're going to need at each place in your, aid st in, in your drop bags, but think, you know, what happens if I'm, you know, a couple hours slower? Or what happens if I'm a couple hours faster than I'm planning? Is that going to change what I need? And, you know, you, things like, you know, do you have flashlights? You know, do you have dark glasses? Um, you know, do you have the right kind of clothes? Um, that same time when I was following Scott Gordon and, and his pacer, uh, we, were, we were going up and there's one place we had crossed this river and Scott slipped and went completely underwater. You know, came up spluttering and it was below freezing. It was really cold. And, you know, <laughs> he was soaked to the skin and it was two hours before dawn and, and it was below freezing. And, you know, between myself and, and his pacer, I think his pacer, gave him his his like windbreaker shell but that was the only extra clothing that any of us could spare and you know scott got pretty cold and you know probably would have been good if he'd you know had an extra an extra layer or something you know uh to put on so uh those kinds of planning things are real important for for a successful race and you know sometimes you get lucky and you can get away without having to do that kind of thing but you know, if, if your luck turns against you, that's something that sometimes ends people's races. I know I said that was the last question, but then I, <laughs> if you have time, I forgot to ask about ghost towns and mining. Oh, yeah. Actually, up, up here on the course, we, uh, you know, the, the, this whole area is just honeycombed with mines. And there are several places on the course where we pass old, old mine ruins that are, I find, kind of amazing to see you know i mean these are these are big things of metal you know you know from an old mill or something you know big gears and and stuff that weighs hundreds and hundreds of pounds that somebody carried up there you know on their backs or on pack animals you know these these you know this isn't road access these are places that are way up in the mountains on trails and to think of what it took to get that stuff up there um you know, in the hope of making a buck in a mine, it's, it's kind of unbelievable. And, you know, I mean, that's, that's sort of why this run was, was established uh, here in, here it was uh, uh, in 92, the, mine, the last mine in this area had just closed and Silverton here was kind of a depressed place, um, you know, because all of a sudden the employment was gone. And, um, uh, you know, Charlie Thorne and Gordon Hardman and John Kappas started up this race um, as as a way of uh, you know bringing a little bit of income into the uh, into the community, and and actually it's had a pretty significant financial impact on the community. Uh, and the community is doing much better now, you know, 25 years later after the first time this was run. But um, the the hardship and toughness of the people that established some of those mines up there is something that's really worth keeping in mind, you know, when you're out there running on the course feeling sorry for yourself because you're tired <laughs> or you're cold. <laughs> I've always thought of mining was, you know, must be kind of like, a uh, little like fishing in the sense that, you know, you never know what the next cast is going to get you, you know. And you can cast all day and still, or, or gambling, the same kind of thing. You know, you throw the dice or, you know, and, and everybody thinks, okay, the next time is going to be the magic one, you know. And I think mining is probably the same way, particularly prospecting, you know, for mining. 
where you think, you know, I just got to, you know, just got to chip another, you know, six inches into this, into this wall, into this tunnel, and, and there it'll be, you know, the mother load, the rich, you know, the, the rich vein I've been looking for. Um, now, in, in industrial scale mining, like was going on here, of course, for a lot of people, it was, it was a job that they went to every day and um, a way to make a living. And, um, and I have to think that probably for most of them, it was not just a way to make a living, but a way to make a living in a, you know, living in a beautiful place, um, you know, that that would contribute to it. But um, tough road to hoe. That's the thing that really first attracted me to, to the Hard Rock course, because when I came out here the first time, um, you know, this, this was a course that I would be happy to spend a week backpacking on. I mean, it's that beautiful. It's that kind of quality, uh, uh, beautiful terrain. And, you know, to have the opportunity to run it in a day and a half is, is pretty remarkable.